Professor Oakwell, Professor Sinclair, and dear all, good afternoon and welcome to the seminar text analysis with Wayon Tools organized by the Aristotle University team of Apollonis project. I'm Titika Dimitrulia, I'm the coordinator of the project at Aristotle University, and I would like to thank, uh, really from my heart, uh, our guest speaker, Jeffrey Rockwell, Professor of Philosophy and Digital Humanities at the University of Alberta. And uh, uh, we had a wonderful surprise. Also, his collaborator and the way on lead, Professor Stefan Sinclair, Associate Professor of Digital Humanities at McGill University. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, before I pass the floor, though, to our speakers, two words only uh, on our project, Apollonis, and uh, on this seminar. Uh, Apollonis is the national infrastructure that supports and promotes digital humanities and arts and language technology and innovation in Greece. It was created by the partnership of the National Network of Linguistic Technology, CLARIN L, and the National Digital Infrastructure Network for the Humanities, uh, DARIA, which are components of the respective European infrastructures, CLARIN and DARIA. Uh, our team <coughs> uh, belongs to the CLARIN project. Uh, and CLARIN is a permanent and stable infrastructure where researchers uh, have access to digital language resources and uh, online processing services. Uh, the CLARIN L is a great part of the European CLARIN infrastructure and um, uh, Greece became a member of CLARIN Eric in February uh, 2015. Uh, Aristotle University also joined CLARIN in uh, 2014 uh, and became member with CLARIN L, uh, of CLARIN Eric in 2015. In the context of our project uh, at Aristotle University, uh, uh, which uh, wants to promote the knowledge and use of language resources and tools in the humanities and the social sciences, we organized seminars. Uh, we will organize seminars. This is the first one, and there will be, a, uh, we hope, many others uh, in uh, the next months. Uh, you can find uh, useful information about uh, uh, Apollonis, uh, uh, Aristotle University team, and um, the digital humanities and the language technology on the side where you registered. And as I know that uh, all of you are here uh, because of uh, Jeffrey Rockwell, be uh, I think you, most of you, you know well or less well, but you know uh, Voyant Tools, the so popular Voyant Tools in text analysis, uh, and uh, their developers, as we are delighted to have also. Stefan Sinclair with us. Uh, I uh, will pass immediately the floor uh, to Professor Rockwell. Thank you very much for, for your very kind invitation. And uh, I'm sorry that I am not able to be there in, in person. I, I am particularly sorry because uh, I would have loved to travel to Greece, but uh, another time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit at first about how we're gonna how we're gonna run the workshop and then uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Stefan to maybe say a few words about uh, uh, Voyant and the development of Voyant because he is really the, the, the lead and the genius behind it and uh, then we are gonna proceed on the workshop uh, so I have created this outline of the workshop which is what you're seeing here it has most of the links that you need, and I can, if needs be, I can add stuff as people ask questions and so on like that. I've divided in into two sections with maybe a little five minute break so that everybody can go get uh, another espresso or a tea. And the first section is gonna be very introductory. So those of you who have already played with Voyant, um, 
you know, maybe you'll learn something new, maybe not. Uh, I beg your forgiveness. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm typically going to show a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit and ask questions, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of time to play with uh, Voyant. I'm going to talk a little bit as I go through this about how um, we teach Voyant when we're teaching it in an actual class. Just so, because I, I imagine some of you are not only interested in using Voyant for your own research, but you're also interested, you may also be interested in teaching it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the logic of how we teach it. The second half after the break will jump to much more advanced topics to give you a, a taste of some of the advanced topics which may be useful to you if you're doing different types of projects. For example, um, I, I, you know, I, in some of the introductions before, I, I understood that some of you are looking at political discourse, uh, some of you may be looking at translation and so on like that. So we're gonna be looking at some ways of building corpora, and then we're gonna be looking at some text mining tools and uh, I'm guessing that that will be as far as we get uh, uh, in, the, in the two hours that we have. I've created a number of, uh, uh, a lot of materials which you can use after this workshop. The, the key thing is to go to Dialogica. If you actually just type the word, you know, if you just go to Dialogica, so the .ca is for Canada. So dialogical things, if you just, if you just go to uh, Dialogica, uh, you will get to this website. And from this website, you can get to various uh, walkthroughs. These walkthroughs, so if you click on one of these, you come to a, a, a Google Drive area with walkthroughs, but also some of the examples, including this, this workshop outline right here. If, it's, if you like the outline, you can take it and use it yourself. These walkthroughs, if you open them, they're all Microsoft Word files and they're shared under a Creative Commons license. These walkthroughs are designed to be something that you could walk through and read and try yourself. So they're also designed to be something that you could give your students. You could, you could imagine a class where on Zoom where you you do a little bit of preparation, you set up a scene, you give them the walkthrough, and then at the end, you might uh, edit some of the exercises that we put. We put some sort of example exercises, and you might edit this to suit your, yourself. So if anything goes by too quickly, I encourage you to go back to uh, these walkthroughs and to try to go through it yourself. We've been writing these walkthroughs very quickly because of the pandemic, we've been trying to get these up and useful to people. So you're bound to find typos. And I hope you will uh, feel free to send us uh, your thoughts on how they can be improved. And I put my email right here. Uh, you can also on Twitter, you can actually, uh, Voyant has its own Twitter account. So you can leave questions on Twitter on Twitter, or you can, uh, uh, I'm also on Twitter and Stefan is on Twitter. So that's sort of an overview of how we're going to proceed. I'm now going to uh, pass it over to Stefan. Do you want to say a few words? <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, so um, I, I want to, I think Jeffrey's really going to focus uh, on Voyant as it can be used today. Um, so, um, uh, you know, the usefulness, the the functionality and so on uh, as of today. What I wanted to do is to um, take a bit of a um, wandering backwards uh, to um, to sort of give you a sense of where Voyant comes from and um, the legacy that that um, is involved in it. I won't do that in a lot of detail. Um, we don't have time, um, but I want to mention that um, uh, before Voyant, uh, there were um, efforts um, that actually resonate with um, some of what Daria is doing um, as well in terms of trying to set up um, 
a portal system uh, for um, tools, um, to some extent, a repository system for text as well. Um, and uh, under under the um, under the umbrella of the Tapor project, and before Tapor, there was um, uh, uh, there were other projects that um, uh, Jeffrey had written uh, some experimental implementations of some of the text analysis code in Ruby um, that um, that we uh, that. That, that provided some additional sort of um, context for us to think about what we were doing. Um, and before that, there was um, Hyperpo um, that I worked on um, in the early, in the mid 90s, mid to late 90s, um, that was intended to really, you know, as the web was first emerging, um, to take advantage of some of the possibilities for doing text, text analysis. but um, using web um, capabilities uh, because um, we're talking about uh, you know 1994 or five here um, so the web's only been um, invented for uh, um, fewer than four or five years and um, not really popularized it's just sort of on the cusp of something that's um, that's turning big and even before that, there's there's tools that um, we could point at, and I won't I won't go further back in in the history of tool development, but I want to say that we are part of a um, continuity of uh, working through tools and thinking about how tools uh, shape our understanding of the text that we have available and the, the things that we can do with them as researchers, um, the kinds of things that we can um, interpret and, um, and analyze. Um, I wanted to um, just mention that um, it happens fairly often that um, users use why not and encounter a problem and assume that they have made a mistake. And I want to encourage you all to shift that reasoning. So if you can think with me mentally, stay in your head after me. Uh, uh, I will not. I, I, you could say, oh, I said say it in your head. Okay, so say it in your head. I will not uh, assume that any problems are due to me, but rather that there are bugs in Voyant and uh, that I'm going to report them to Jeffrey and Stefan. Um, so um, uh, seriously, they, they, you know, there are some things, there are some uh, problems we know about, but Voyant continues to improve um, largely thanks to people who use them we use, we use uh, the tool set and who provide us with feedback and also who provide us with just encouragement. Um, Voyant is um, exceptional as a project in the history of digital humanities as something that's lasted for well over a decade and uh, that continues to grow. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons that we won't go into here, but um, it, it really is um, what Leib, Jeffrey, and I um, uh, do, and um, we're, we're always pleased to hear from users. And I'll stop there. Great. So uh, I've actually put up a, a, a page here for the book the Voyant, uh, if you're interested in more of the sort of history and the hermeneutical thinking, uh, we've got a book from MIT Press and we managed to convince them to let us to put four chapters up. And the four chapters are actually the ones that show how we use uh, Voyant. So that's at uh, the domain name Hermeneutica. You'll probably notice by now Dialogica, Hermeneutica, Theoretica, that, that I've cornered the Canadian the market for Canadian domain names. <clears throat> so at this point, I'm gonna jump forward 
For, so for those of you who installed your own, uh, who installed your, uh, uh, um, well, whether you installed it or not, I'm, I'm going to jump straight into how I start now a, uh, a, a workshop. And so what I typically do is I start with this uh, screen. And this here, uh, this is running off my own personal installed version of Wyant. Uh, and it's a word cloud. And I start with this partly to help people understand how to use an individual tool. One of the things you can do in Voyant is instead of working with the collections of tools, you can work with an individual tool. And I start with this one because a lot of people have seen word clouds. Um, this word cloud uh, is going to look different every time you run it. And so one of the things I do to get students and colleagues thinking about uh, how these tools can help interpret text is I ask them to think about why it looks different on every screen and to think about where these graphical features come from. And we often have if this was a, a workshop in a room, we would have a short conversation. What are the graphical features in this visualization and where do they come from? And usually people will point out, well, the bigger words are probably the higher frequency words, the words that appear more often in the text. And that's right. So that's a, a graphical feature that is what I call metrical. It's based on a measurement of the text. And then somebody sort of wonders about uh, color. Where does you know, the words have different colors. Where do the colors come from? And the colors are actually a random walk in the program. There is no, uh, there, the, it has nothing to do with the text. And, and in fact, there is the capacity, if you want to, to set a color palette. You know, if you're trying to make a nice poster for a talk or something like that, you can set a color palette and change the colors yourself. So right there, we have some features that are coming from the text and some features that are coming from the developers and decisions that they made. And so I often, I often show this in order to, to help students understand how these tools are not an objective interpretation of the text unless you understand which features are metrical and which are not. We talk about other features like centrality. The words in the center tend to be, but are not always higher frequency. So that I start with a sort of hermeneutical thing. Then I sort of explain how a panel works. So um, I show, for example, up here, if we mouse over, we get some various features. The most important is probably the help. If you click on the question mark, you're going to get help for this panel or this tool. I often use the word tool and panel interchangeably. And if you click more help, you actually go to the full help, which is well worth uh, exploring. I'm not going to explore it right now. The other features here, you have an options button. And this options button opens up a panel which will, which will change from tool to tool and will give you different options. One of the uh, important options is the stop words. So I imagine all of you who are linguists are probably sitting there going, you know, well, these are high frequency words, but I know that in English, there's, there, there are, there's a bunch of words that are missing. The, for example, is a very high frequency word in all, just about any English prose, and it's not here. So they must be filtering out uh, stop words, and that's where this is happening right here. And you'll see that we different people have contributed. We don't have a modern Greek stop word list. Somebody has contributed an ancient Greek one. Oh yes, we do have a modern Greek one. Um, the, the stop word list, you can edit it. You can take the opposite approach if you want the, and create a white list. A white list would be where you enter the words that you wanna see and only those words. So you, you basically tell Voyant, I want to see the word cloud just of the words uh, of this list of words. I'm not interested in other ones. 
And then, as I said, you can change uh, the, the color palette and the font and some like that. So those are the options. And every panel will have an options, but they will vary. We then have another uh, feature over here, which uh, shows up. This allows us to switch in the panel we're looking at, allows us to switch to just about any uh, other tool. So for example, I'm gonna switch to the terms tool. This is the same list of high frequency words, but now it's in a list. Uh, so, which which can be for many of you might actually be more useful to have it in the list than to have it in um, in a cloud form. I'm going to go back to Cyrus, and then finally we have here a, a button that allows me to export. Uh, the panel that I'm looking in different ways. The main way, the, the top way, if you simply click on a URL, this will open up a new tab or a new window and will show just that tool, but we're already looking at it, so there's no point. Uh, you can, uh, these are more advanced uses. You can actually uh, export a chunk of XML, um, HTML that you could put into a website which would embed the interactive panel right in the website. And uh, you can export an image if you wanna drop it into a paper. So if you like this thing or you wanna create a poster, you can export that. So that's the, the, the controls and every one of the panels will have different versions of these controls up there. But uh, the panels will also have controls that are specific to the panel down in the lower left-hand corner. In this case, we only have one control, which is the number of terms. So if we increase it, we get, we get more. If we decrease it, we get fewer ones. So I've now given you a, a, a little introduction to one tool or one panel. Um, I'd like you now to all uh, try going to this link here. If, you're, if you've installed your own version of Voyant, uh, if you've installed your own version of Voyant and you don't want to use our, our general server, when you fire it up, you should see this and you can open a text like Austin's novels. You can open a, a text like Austin's novels and you'll see the same panel but you'll see it in a, in a full display. So I'd like everyone to just take a moment to play around with uh, the, the Cyrus word cloud and then start asking me questions about these panels here. And, and I apologize that we can't problem solve with all of you over Zoom, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. And I think the idea is they'll go through, uh, uh, they'll go through one or two people. I've opened up the comments also so that people can uh, if you want to type a question in. Yes. <clears throat> For the moment being, I don't see any questions. So I don't know, maybe. Shall I? Uh, I'll go on then. Yes. I think so. I don't see any questions in. No. So I, I, I'm going to ask a question. Some of you may, uh, if I'm going to ask a question of you, can anyone guess what, what this text is? If you looked at the, looking at the words, can you make a guess at what this uh, text is? It, it's actually, uh, you'd, you'd have to sort of know the text, but Felix, Clerval, Cottage, Horror, Father, Man. 
This is uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And one of the reasons why I often show uh, Frankenstein is because in some sense, what we're doing with Voyant is a little bit like what Dr. Frankenstein did to people, but we're doing them to text. What a text analysis environment does is it often chops the text up into little pieces, words, sentences, uh, sections, and then it reassembles it into new texts. And what you're seeing in this word cloud is a new text which has a relationship to the old text. Uh, so I think of it as a little bit like uh, uh, what Dr. Frankenstein did, but but unlike Frankenstein, we don't abandon our 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 new creations at the moment of birth. We 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 take care of them and nurture them. So I am now going to switch to the uh, the next section right here. So as I said, I often start with with uh, with with people looking at one panel and making sure that they have time to play with one panel. And I encourage you to, to, to play around yourselves with, with a panel. And then what I do is I expand the view out to what we call a view or a skin. So this is a view. This is also Mary Shelley's Fra Frankenstein. But this view is made up of multiple panels, many tools. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you manipulate views. So I'm not gonna talk about the individual tools, I'm gonna to talk about how you can deal with a view with multiple tools. So one thing you can do, a little bit like Excel, is you, you can change the space that uh, any one tool gets. So you can expand one of the, if you wanna see more of the word cloud, you can expand the space it gets. You can always play with the controls. I just increased the number of terms. A second thing you can do with any one of these panels is we've actually provided other tools in the same panel. So by clicking, and we've tried to make a decision about the, the most useful tools here. So if I don't like, the word cloud, the Cyrus word cloud, I can switch to terms, which gives me the same list of words, but now as a table. Or I could switch, uh, switch to what is called links, which is a very particular tool that uh, uh, I encourage you to play around with. Um, it, what it shows is for the words that you're entering here, uh, it shows the collocates, and uh, so you can sort of try to get a sense of the of the linguistic neighborhood. Uh, that said, in any one of these panels, you can always go and you can get at any one of the other tools. They're all there, so there's nothing preventing you from customizing this view until you get exactly the mix of tools that you want. So uh, uh, another thing, so I, I mentioned how you can change the size of the panels. You can uh, change the tools that are in any particular panel. And a, another thing that you can do that can sometimes be useful, if you see a panel that you like, so this one here is called Trends. It shows the distribution of the words. If you see a panel that you like, if you click on the export, and this is where exporting a URL for just that tool and data, it, it will expand the panel into a new tab. So it can be very useful to go back and forth from the more crowded view with lots of tools, but you may want to zoom in on one tool in particular. Uh, so those are some of the things that you can do when you're controlling the panels. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the trends tool because this is another tool that's very useful. In fact, this is one of the ones I use the most. 
uh, and this tool has more settings. So in this tool, when you open it up by default, it just takes the five high frequency, the five highest frequency words with the stop word list, and it graphs those. But you can graph any tool, any word that you want. So for example, you might want to graph monster. And notice how I'm in the lower hand uh, in that little uh, search box. And the search box is very responsive. So always uh, go slow when you're using it because when you type a word, we auto suggest and we suggest, for example, here, there's the word monster or monsters. And then there's monster asterisk, which is a sort of truncation search. And if I click that, I will see a, a graph of monster and monsters. I can change the display. So I can uh, get an area graph. I can get columns, uh, the line graph. And of course, we tend to, we tend to use this one. The, the columns are really more accurate, but the, the line uh, looks much better, more pleasing to the eye. So we, we, we combine them together. Now, one of the things you may be asking is how did we decide to graph this word over 10 segments of the text? And this is, uh, this is where trends can get extremely powerful, especially if you're working with a corpus, which I'm not. I am right now, I'm working with a single text. When you give it a single text, it will automatically divide the text into 10 equal chunks. But if you go up to the options, you can actually change the number of segments. So I could change it to 20 chunks. And it's important sometimes to do this because you may think that you're seeing some interesting pattern of, oh my God, in Frankenstein, he deals with a monster much more, you know, but, but, but you know, if you change the segments, you'll find that you've got a different answer. Uh, so sometimes you want to just double check by changing the number of segments. <clears throat> Later on, when I show you a corpus, you'll see that the segments are not automatically segmented but they are based on the documents of the corpus. So this allows you, for those of you who want to do, I don't know, political discourse. Um, I was just, a, just for the fun of it, I went and grabbed all the press conferences of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Uh, the press conferences where Donald Trump gets up and says, very strange things about uh, the virus and, and how to cure it. And then various people like Vice President Pence and Fauci, Dr. Fauci and someone like that also talk. And, and they have, the White House has the transcripts to all of these and I grabbed and made a corpus pretty quickly of 29 press conferences. And, I, and by naming them with the date of the press conference, I can get in this distribution graph, I can get the distribution of terms over the different documents or press, uh, press briefings. Rather than just getting automatic segmentation, I get it by the documents that I want uh, in, in the corpus. So I'm going back to the default display. And you'll see that this search box, which we saw in trends, also shows up in other tools. You see it in the full text reader. You see it in uh, the context. So you can, you can actually control a number of the tools directly. But there's another way that you can control the tools. In Voyant, these different tools are loosely concatenated. So if I click on a word in Cyrus, it automatically updates trends. And in fact, it's even updated, it's even created this little uh, spark line at the bottom of the reader. And then if I click 
on uh, one of the trends, I go, okay, the word man really shows up a lot in the middle of Frankenstein. Let's see how that's used. Clicking there updates the keyword in context, this display down here. And clicking on the keyword in context goes to the full text. If you're not happy with one line of text, you can go straight to the full text. And this is where one of our uh, hermeneutical principles of Voyant is that you should always be able to go from the distant reading of, of like a word cloud right down to the context and the full text and then back up. So in fact, if I, um, if I click here, phantasm, that looks like an interesting. So in fact, phantasm is also triggering things. It's not a word that shows up a lot. So you can, for each one of these panels, you can try to trigger the other panels. So I'm going to, I've, I've now given you a sense of how these, uh, this, uh, this view works, how you can work with different panels and stuff. I'm going to stop a section and a second and take some questions. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, there is a question concerning the links and the collocations. Okay. Uh, they would like that you explain further uh, the links function. Okay. So this is, uh, what I'm gonna do is I, I've got the links tool here. I'm gonna actually expand it into its own tab, just so that we have more uh, space. Uh, I'm going to actually type in a word. So I'm gonna start with a word, uh, monster. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna clear, and then I'm gonna type in monster to just to make it clear what I'm doing. So what what this is doing is it's taking the word monster and it's looking at the context uh, of you know everywhere where the word monster is it's looking at five words on either side and then it is then it is creating, if you will, a frequency sorted word list of the collocates, the words that co-locate, and it's showing me five of them. If I double click, it shows me more. If I uh, don't like one of the words, I sit there and go, hmm, mm, saw. If I hold the control key down, I'm on a Macintosh, so this would be right clicking, I can actually uh, remove a word. But agony looks really interesting, so I can now fetch collocates for agony. So I now have agony, and I can, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I could double click and get more collocates. So you can sort of wander around the vocabulary and collocates looking at what words connect to what words. If you go here, um, yeah, so, uh, sorry, that wasn't what I was looking for. If you go down here where it says context, you can expand the context in which we are grabbing collocates. And of course, the moment you do that, you get a whole mess more. And, uh, and every time we do that, we're getting more and more. Uh, I'm going to clear this and start all over again because for a while, moment there, we got a little too many. So uh, that's how this works. It's, it, it's actually a lot of fun to explore vocabulary and the, col the collocates. You can sort of sit there and go, hmm, I wonder how the word monster is being used. And you can sort of, then you can explore collocates to collocates and you can build very idiosyncratic, <clears throat> if you will, networks of words. It's important when you show this to people that you explain that you, that this is, this is not a completely objective 
you know, social network map, if you will, of the language, because you're, you're choosing what words, you're removing, trimming, and adding, and dragging, and so on like that. So it, 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 it allows you to create a, a, a network of words that co-locate that are meaningful uh, to you. There is um, another tool that does something. Ta -ta -ta, let me see if I can find it. Um, it does something a little bit similar. It tries to create these word trees. So it shows uh, this shows you what words are directly before. And uh, by clicking on them, I can sort of see a sentence here. You know, um, gigantic monster whom I had created. So you can sort of, this is another tool for sort of exploring the context of a particular word. Does that uh, answer your question? Yes, I think so. I have no reaction from, from the person who asked the question, but I have another question, if I may, from another participant. Yes, let, let me just show one more tool. This is the collocates okay. tool. So here you can actually see a table of, there's the term monster. These are the words that collocate. Here's the count. You know, there are five instances of let near monster. So go ahead and ask, ask your other question. Mm -hmm. So what, what was yes. the next question? The next question is um, if there is a possibility to upload uh, a group of texts uh, and uh, process them um, separately. I'm not really sure I understand. I mean, I think that the question is if there is a possibility to process the texts but separately and not as a whole corpus. Yes, uh, I actually use the word corpus for when, for when we process them separately. And I'm actually going to, so the, the, ne the next thing I'm gonna show is how you upload a text. And then after the break, I'm gonna talk about how you can form mm -hmm. corpora and, and process them while keeping the documents separate. Because you can just take a whole mess of texts and you know, concatenate them and treat them as one big one, but um, the, the, there are ways, the, the, it, it can get very interesting to process a corpus as a corpus and to ask a, a force voyant to keep, to know, to know that they're separate. And so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll be returning to that. That's part of, uh, yeah. Okay, so we'll see soon. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, there's no question, uh, that's all. <laughs> okay, no questions. This oh, is no, 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 now, oh no, no, another one now. The Great. segments in trends, uh, they would like to to know some more. The segments in threads uh, was not clear enough for someone. Uh, okay. The segments so, in trends. Uh, maybe the way the segmentation is done uh, in trends, maybe. I think so. Okay. So the segmentation. I'm going to go back to. I'm going to go back to the. Um, uh, what tool was it I was looking at? The, the trends. Mm -hmm. So if you upload one and only one text, it segments it uh, uh, by default, it will divide it into 10 equal sections. And basically it'll graph uh, the language that you're using, the, 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 the words that you're looking at, it will graph the relative frequency. Um, you can, I believe, uh, 
in the options, you can choose to graph the raw frequencies. But um, when you're dealing, when we switch to looking at a corpus where you're graphing over documents and the documents are different sizes, it can be important to graph by relative frequency because otherwise a large document will be all things considered the same, will have far more instances of a word and you won't get a, 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 a good visualization of the relative importance. So you can choose to graph by raw or relative. And you can choose to change the number of segments using this little segments bar slider here. So this is in the options and we hit confirm. Things are gonna look very different when we switch to a corpus. So I'm actually, I'm gonna, for the purposes of just showing this, I'm gonna jump ahead. We're now looking at the Austin corpus. So this is the <laughs> novels of Jane Austen. This little tool in the lower left-hand corner there, which says documents, this shows us now, before we just had one document, now, the system knows that we have eight documents and these documents are actually named in chronological order. And so now if we go to the trends, now you'll notice that the graph is not based on segmenting the number of words. This, is, this graph is now segmenting based on the documents that we gave it. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it allows me to, uh, to see that, you know, the word Mr. <laughs> seems to show up far more frequently. The relative frequency of Mr. in Pride and Prejudice and Emma is much higher than the other ones. Now, if I was doing political work, you know, I might have a corpus of two documents. One is everything Trump said about the coronavirus, and one is everything pre uh, Pence said, and maybe another one is everything that Jared uh, Kushner said, and those would be my three documents, and then I could compare the relative frequency of, their, of the language of these three people. Or, or if I had a collection of interviews, and let's say I wanted to look at the role that age played, I might create a document of everyone over 60 uh, another document of everyone between 50 and 60, and then everyone between uh, younger than 50. And then I would get, then I could compare the use of these wor words across these different documents. So the creation and management of corpora is actually um, important to how you use some of these tools. And I'll be talking a little bit more about one or two different techniques for creating and managing uh, corpora. Uh, some some more advanced techniques. That's what I'm I'm going to talk about after the after the break. So uh, did that answer the question? Did 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 that make sense? Or did I go too quickly? I, yes, absolutely. Everything is fine. Thank you very much. Uh, any any other question? No, I don't see anything, so uh, you can proceed or uh, as okay. you wish. Well, what I'm going to do is, is uh, um, Windows. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about how, um, how you get texts into Voyant in the first place. So you've seen how to use it. But uh, so far, I've let you use it only with, um, uh, with text that were already loaded. And so now I'm sliding down to this section here, introduce how to get text into Voyant. And you, the, the, the screen I'm showing you is the same as the one that you would get if you just went to the voyanttools.org address. Uh, I'm just using this off my own computer just to make sure that it goes smoothly and fast. Um, and, uh, because if I think there's 75 of you online, if you all start clicking the same thing that I click, it's, and it's all going to Montreal and back, it slows things down. But this is what you get. This is the entry screen. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the entry screen and then I'm going to show three or four different ways to get text in. So uh, before I do that, so we have here, we have, a, we, we have some help. We have, so you can always remind yourself of different ways of doing this just by this mousing over the help, with the question mark. We have options and I'll be turning to the options after the break. This is where the really advanced corpus stuff kicks in. And we also have a language feature, which allows you to change the language in which you're gonna view uh, Voyant. It changes, I'm switching to Italian, it changes uh, all, the, um, all the interface language. It does not change the language of the text. This is not a translation tool. It just makes the, uh, the it, it changes it to the language. And uh, as I was mentioning uh, before this started, it would be great if there was uh, a team that wanted to work with us to create a, a modern Greek interface. So now I'm gonna show three different ways of getting some text. The first place I'm going to Aristotle University. If I, uh, I'm going to go to your your website here, the university. Here's your mission. So one way is the simplest way is just to select some text, and I find and paste it in. So I can select some text. I hit reveal and and it works. Now I'm I'm not going to bother with that because it's not really that much text. A more interesting way, so I'm going to grab the URL, the address of your university's vision, and I'm going to paste the URL in and I'm going to hit reveal and this is where we all uh, cross our fingers and hope that it works because this is uh, that's exactly the sort of thing that that fails, just give, I'm gonna use the main server. There, so I have now loaded, uh, I have told Voyant to go to your home page, not your home page, but to your vision page, and to load the vision of your university as a single text, uh, so it's not a particularly big one. And as you can see, it includes some of the, you know, the, the, it includes a certain amount of administrative stuff, user, search, my auth, those are, those are probably buttons. Uh, we have navigation stuff. But then down here, we actually have the, the vision. And we can, I can begin to sort of try to draw some inferences about uh, the, the vision of the university. I mean, one thing that stands out is that you guys use AUTH as, as, as the acronym, if you will, for the Aristotle University, um, so on and so on and so on. It's, this is sort of, I won't go into it, but it's sort of fun to sometimes take university visions and ask, uh, you know, what do they say about what the university thinks is important or, or not important? So that's, that's one way to get um, to get a text in a related way, so I can grab I can grab the, the vision, and this gets to the question about how do you how do you get more than one text? I can actually give it more than one URL, so I can grab the vision. Uh, what would be another one? Uh, a good one. Quality Assurance Unit, wow. Um, I don't think we have a Quality Assurance Unit, but uh, th there we go. And uh, we have to keep our fingers crossed because this is where things tend to break down. In fact, if uh, I, I generally rec this is fine for playing around. If you're actually doing a study, you should manually grab the text from each one of the URLs and create an a corpus and document it because you never know when these URLs are going to disappear or they're going to cause trouble or something like that. But you see now we've got two texts. So you see over here, uh, this is my screen. So we now have a corpus with two texts, vision and quality. And we can begin to see the difference in the language between these two texts. 
So I'm going to stop a second and ask if anybody has questions. Yes, indeed, there are two questions. Um, if you could explain what is vocabulary density, but uh, I don't know, perhaps uh, later, it's up to you. And there is another question, I think it is answered already, but uh, still, uh, if we provide the main URL of the site, will we only drill down 12 pages and grab content on, or only for the page that will show up with a specific URL entered in the tools interface? I'm sorry, could you repeat that second question? Yes. If we provide the main URL of the site, uh, but, uh, for example, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, will Voyant drill down to all pages and grab content, or only for the page that will show up with a specific URL and enter it in the tools interface? Yeah, yeah, only the specific URL. So Voyant, uh, you, Voyant uh, should not be used as a scraper. Um, if what you want to do is to drill down, you should you should really uh, get a scraper, get a tool that is meant for scraping. Now, if you're interested in in scraping tools, there's a project that was funded by the um, uh, by the NEH that, uh, let me see, uh, so this is a project, I'll put the, I'll, I'll put the URL into uh, the, the uh, workshop there. So this is a, this is a team, I, I think they're down in North Carolina. They have built a command line tool that you can download for free and run on your computer which will try to do different types of scraping. It'll try to scrape Twitter, it'll try to scrape web pages. Um, I'm trying to remember what else it scrapes. Uh, they are building, they got a new grant and they're building a version of this which will hook up to Voyant. So you can do the scrape and they're trying to improve the interface to make it easier to use. So they're trying to rebuild it so that you can um, you know, run a scrape and then uh, launch Voyant on the scrape. So that's one solution. Another solution, if you're a programmer, is there's lots of libraries for Python for doing scraping. A third solution, I don't know if your library, so my library has, uh, has a service called Archive It. Archive It is the service version of what the Internet Archive uses. So Archive It is um, for, so my library has um, uh, one of its functions is to archive web pages, uh, uh, web pages that are important to Alberta, the government web pages and stuff like that. They have paid for a subscription to the Archive It service. I go to them and I give them a set of seed URLs. I mean, it takes a while, I've got to negotiate with them, but I give them the seed URLs and I tell them, for this one, I want you to go down two levels and I want you to check every month. This one, I don't want you to go down, but I want you to check every day. So in fact, right now, we, we have given them a whole mess of seeds in order to scrape anything to do with the COVID pandemic. We're trying to we're trying to create a snapshot, a web archive of all the web pages uh, that, that are in Alberta, news sites, uh, government, pro provincial government sites. So this is, but this is a much more complicated, this is not something you run, this is something your library needs to negotiate. It's based on a complicated tool. I don't know if you want to, if you all want to work together, you can actually get the software behind Archive It. Um, but you'd really need a Unix programmer to install it. I can't remember what it's called right now, but um, so that's, that's uh, you, you've got all these different levels of building scrapers. And I think for PCs, I think there's also some nice, easy to use uh, scrapers that you can use. Uh, but the short answer is Voyant should not be used as a scraper. There, there's better tools out there. 
there is another question concerning the texts uh, processed by Voyant. Uh, what about the text embedded in images and graphs? Can that tool process the verbal content in images as well? No. We can, we can process uh, PDFs, but only PDFs that also have the text behind uh, the page image, if you will. We can process Microsoft Word files. We can process XML, HTML. We don't always make the best decisions about what to strip out. So if you're processing HTML, it's a good, uh, it, it, if you really have a serious research project, it's best to download the HTML pages yourself and then, you know, manually extract the text so you don't get all the navigation stuff and, and so on. Um, but we, no, we don't do OCR. And for, for OCR, if you had a whole mess of images, and you wanted to extract the text, that's where I would use um, either an OCR tool. So I personally use, uh, I use a tool called DevonThink. It, I, it's, it's, not an, it's not only for OCR, it does all sorts of things, but it has OCR built in. So there are nice OCR tools that you can give them a whole mess of documents and it will extract the text. There is, if you're programmer, there is OCR built into, for example, Mathematica. There are OCR libraries built into Python. So, so either you have to buy a commercial OCR tool to run your images through, or you're going to need to, uh, uh, you know, get a, a do a bit of programming to do that. Um, and the that, last I've question for that. the moment. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say that's a very good question, and, and it gets at the, the the sort of philosophical idea. Viant is really for the analysis. It's not for the gathering and extracting of data. Um, so that's where you know I'm happy to tell people about tools that we use, but we try to keep the two separate because there's you know OCR there's no way that we could keep up with the state of the art with OCR um, especially in the moment you get to things like medieval manuscripts you need highly specialized trainable OCR systems in order to deal with weird and wonderful uh, orthography and stuff so the last question can I <laughs> please if you could explain uh, uh, what vocabulary density is, is the last right. Uh, I, I, I was trying to avoid that since my mind has just gone blank. Uh, this is a good chance to see whether or not we actually describe it. No, we just say that we do that. I'm guessing it. I'm guessing it is a measurement of the, the hapax legomena and hapax dislegomena. So a um, I, this is a guess, and uh, I don't know if Stefan is still on the line, but uh, it's it's a it's a measurement of how many unique words or uh, uh, unique words there are. So a denser text will have more unique words. A less dense text will have um, a smaller vocabulary and won't use as many unique words. Uh, that that's a guess. And it's something we should uh, we should check. This summary here is meant to just uh, is meant to sort of give you a quick and you know a quick sort of picture of what your your corpus is about. So I'm going to go back to um, I'm going to go back to uh, I'm going to go back to showing other ways of entering text. So another way to enter text is you can click the open button and we have two corpora available that they're just sort of preloaded. And this is true of the version you download and install locally. And it's also true of the version on the server. 
And this is just, uh, this is useful if you want to immediately start playing around without building your own corpus. So I think I showed the Austin corpus of novels. And we also have the, the corpus of Shakespeare plays. We can, um, one of the things, if you look up at the URL here, you'll see that you, you can actually get at the Austin just by typing question mark corpus equals Austin. And we have some other corpora that are up there like Frank for Frankenstein. So I can actually just call some of these named corpora directly from up there. The last way, and this is when you start doing a lot of work with Voyant, becomes the most important. The last way is to upload documents yourself. So when you click upload, it gives you access to uh, your own uh, hard drive. So for example, uh, um, later on, uh, I'm gonna show this very small corpus I created of uh, web pages having to do with Elton John. So I just, it's an XML file and I just opened it from my own hard drive. Because I opened it as a, as a single file, it, it doesn't know that there's multiple documents. And this is one of the things I'll be showing you. Uh, it's a more advanced feature, how to use XML to, seg to segment according to XML elements. Um, and unfortunately, that it's the sort of thing where you have to understand something about XML uh, in order for that to make sense. But I will give a, a quick sort of uh, overview just to tease people into learning about XML. So I've now gone through, and, and as I mentioned, uh, you can open up a PDF and it will try to extract the text, but only if the PDF has the text already in it and you know sometimes you get pdfs if you click and drag over the text you're reading um, it selects the text that's a sign that there is actual text behind if you try clicking and dragging and it doesn't select the text then it means that the pdf is just an image or it's locked in some way and we can't get it we can also get text out of microsoft word and I'm going to show you after the break how to get text out of Microsoft Excel uh, files. So we can, we can extract from those and not, alas, uh, images. Questions? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. No I, questions? I would propose that we take, um, we take uh, maybe a five minute break just to go get uh, more tea. I see in the chat here. Uh, is there anything in the chat? Yeah. Um, so I will, um, I'm just going to take a, a five minute break and get myself some more tea. And then we'll start, if, if we go back here, we will start on. Uh, section two and this is where we're going to go to the more advanced stuff so you'll come so i'll be back in at uh let's say 9 15 or um what is it uh 6 15 your time okay thank you okay yes. so i'm going to share the screen and go back to yes. uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> there is a question Okay. Uh, from someone who found in GitHub the version 2 for Voyant and asks when Voyant 3 will be available. <coughs> so, uh, Voyant 3, um, I don't know, I, I don't know about the naming. There, there is one of the things we, we use, Voyant 3 would be a very different interface, but we have, um, we already have we already have a new uh, a new interface, which is not so much Voyant three as we're calling it Speedal. So I'm going to show this to you, but uh, please know that this is very buggy. So Speedal is a notebook-based programming environment, 
uh, which extends Voyant. So you can, you program in JavaScript and it can, um, uh, uh, let me see if I can find, um, you, you, you program in JavaScript, so I'm just gonna write a little bit of code here. I, I'm not a, that good a programmer. And if any of you have ever used notebook programming languages like Jupyter, IPython, or Mathematica, this allows you to create a notebook in which you have blocks of text and then blocks of code. Uh, so this is just a little piece of code, four plus five, and it produces nine. And um, one of the things you can do in Voyant is you can create a Spidal notebook, which actually embeds uh, the code will embed a working panel. So you can create, you could imagine you could create a notebook. Uh, if there's things that Spidal does not do, you could create a notebook that would pre-process the text uh, or maybe post-process the results, but you can also call the, the, the panels and you can play, these panels are live. Uh, so, you know, you can, uh, you, you can actually operate on the panels. And so this gives you a combination. So this is not speed, this is not Voyant 3. This is a parallel project. And this is where all of our work is going to build this, this programming environment that extends Voyant and it allows people um, it allows people to, to, to build their own functionality without, without us having to overload the tool. So, um, so that's the, the answer, but Spidal is still very buggy. And uh, um, I think we'll probably announce it um, late summer. That said, one of the things uh, you should think about is is what you how you would like, you know, what would you like to see in Speedal? Um, give us ideas. We 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 do not have a lot of money. A lo most of this programming is Stefan and maybe one or two other programmers and little grants here and there. Uh, so it's it, we're not a big project. We don't collect any money from anyone. Um, but uh, 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 we, we are always interested in hearing from people who find bugs, uh, people who find, um, who have suggestions on things to, to do, to try. Okay. So um, before I actually uh, start talking about building a corpus in Excel, I, I want to address the issue of setting up your own version of Voyant. The, the questioner uh, pointed out that, um, uh, pointed out that um, if the, he, found, he found the Voyant uh, code in GitHub, if you go here, you can see the instructions uh, on how to download the Voyant server to your own machine. And you click, and this takes you to GitHub, and there you can download the most current uh, robust version. As th there are sort of development versions hidden away. But uh, if you download that, that will then, uh, and you expand that code, it will, it, this is what you will get. Um, you will get a Voyant server jar, uh, Java, uh, uh, sort of Java runtime. Um, there's a settings document that you can change some of the settings in. And then there's all sorts of other stuff. If you double click the jar, at least on a Macintosh, and if things are set up right, you, you have to have Java installed. What you get is this. Sorry, I just have to move this out of the way. 
So this is this is running the server, and uh, once you start running the server, it opens a web page in your browser that is the same entry web page that you would get if you came to our server in Montreal. So the interface is always through the web. You're just running the server locally. One of the there are two reasons to run the server locally. Well, three. One is if you're working with a very large corpus, 20 megabytes, 100 megabytes. Uh, I think I have a corpus that's 300 megabytes. Um, if you're working with a very large corpus, you need to expand the amount of memory. So you can see I have here, I've actually given it a gigabyte. Uh, and you can, uh, you, you, you can expand it, uh, you can expand it more and more, but you're obviously, Running it locally, it's going to run faster, and you can give it more memory, um, and so you can handle larger corpora. The second reason for running it locally is that when it crashes, and Voyant is a research tool, uh, they, they, we have no income stream, so it will crash, I guarantee. And as Stefan said, when it crashes, it is not your fault. Uh, when it crashes, you can stop the server and restart it. So, and the third reason for running it locally is confidentiality. When you upload a corpus of text to the central Voyant server, we have to cache it. And even though that cache is going to have a long cryptic name, it is technically accessible to other people. The good thing about uploading it to the central server is that you can then share it with people. The bad thing is if you're uploading confidential interview data or something like that, there is the possibility that somebody could get access to it. There is a way to set a password, but even then the safest way to use Voyant on confidential data is to run it locally and then nobody can get at it. Uh, are there any questions about uh, about running Voyant uh, locally? No, I don't think so. I don't see anything. Good, good. So uh, I'm now going to show one. Uh, I'm going to show two techniques for managing a corpus. The first one is a technique that uses a spreadsheet like Excel. So. Um, the reason for this technique works if you have smaller texts. When I'm teaching students, for example, I will have students um, uh, go to Google and and search for some um, some popular some character somebody in popular culture like Elton John, and then I will have them grab copy the text of each of the important pages about Elton John and paste it into one cell of a spreadsheet and then keep metadata about where they found that text. So what you're looking at here is a short version of that. Here what I did is I grabbed a bunch of different uh, declarations about AI principles. Everyone's all excited about AI, and all sorts of people have posted principles and guidelines for ethical AI. Nobody's going to follow these except for two or three people in the academy, but, but, but nonetheless, everybody is making these great gestures. And so I just grabbed some here, and you see, so this spreadsheet, uh, for example, here in this cell, in the cell F2, I have the Montreal, um, I have the Montreal Declaration. And you can, in, in something like Excel, you can hold up to, I think it's up to 32K of text in, uh, in each cell. So I've got the, the full text of the Montreal Declaration there. And then, I, then I'm keeping metadata here. So I'm keeping the URL where I got it. I'm keeping the country that, where this declaration came from, 
who is the, in some sense, issuer or author, and what is the uh, title. I'm also keeping a, a number here. This refers to a much bigger spreadsheet that has about 100 of these. Um, and then over on the side, I can put comments. I can, if I want, I can add another column. If I wanted to put a column uh, that sort of specified, are these guidelines or are they principles? Is it a commercial a set of guidelines or is it academic? Uh, you know, I can, I can add whatever metadata in columns. And metadata is extremely important. When you start working on a big project, you need to keep track of your corpus. And so when I, especially when I'm teaching and when I, or when I'm working with small texts that are coming off the web, uh, a spreadsheet is a convenient way to be keeping track of my corpus. And it's a convenient way also to manipulate the corpus. One of the things I can do is I can actually select, I could select uh, four of these texts copy them and paste them into a text file, save the text file, and open it in Voyant as a document. So I can quickly create documents organized in different ways uh, that I would open in Voyant as, as corpus. If, I'm, if I was doing interviews, I could have a column for the gender, for the age, uh, for the date of the interview, for where the interview take, took place, or the political affiliation of the interviewee. And then I could actually sort the spreadsheet and I could quickly create, um, I could quickly create documents for, uh, you know, all the women in Thessaloniki that I interviewed versus all the women in Athens and then create two documents and load those as two documents and compare them. So this, this gives the students a way of doing that. And what I'm gonna show now is uh, I have this spreadsheet, is I'm gonna show you how you import the spreadsheet and tell Voyant where it's gonna find the text, where it's gonna find the title, and stuff like that. So I'm switching back to Voyant. So you, you, you've seen the spreadsheet. I'm switching back to Voyant. I'm gonna try to find uh, it's still fetching this corpus. So here, before I upload the text, I'm gonna go to my options. And here is a set of complicated options. Uh, that the, these, um, there's no way to make them simple. And uh, I'm gonna open up the options for tables. So this is what I use if I'm opening, opening a CSV file, which is a standard uh, spreadsheet um, table format or uh, an Excel file. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna tell it that I want it to create a different document for each row. So the Montreal Declaration will be one document. Uh, the, one, the ones from Germany will each be a document and so on. If my spreadsheet did not have a header row, I would click here, but I do actually have a header row, so I leave that. Then I have to tell it which column is gonna be where the content is. And so if we go back here and we count, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Column six is going to be where my content is. And it's actually very useful when it comes to knowing what your segments are uh, to tell it where the title is. So column two, so column two is right here. Column two is B, is where the title is. So I've now defined the parameters for how to process the file that I'm uploading. I click OK. I go to Upload. There's the Excel spreadsheet I was looking at. And we all cross our fingers because this is usually where things break. Uh, they always work when I'm alone. Hey, it worked. So now, if we look over here, well, I'm gonna click on the documents. You'll see that we have each one of those rows. 
suppose, a different document. Now, trends are here is by document I wanted to do if i wanted to search for moral words so i'm going to look for the word good and it looks like uh, uh it's really the japito's uh set of principles which i think is a finnish company which uses the word good nobody else seems to use the word good that much uh social okay the montreal one talks about social so I can now begin to compare uh, these documents. And, and one of the cool things is, is, uh, is I can man manage my corpus and keep track of it. And if I'm gonna write and publish a paper, I need to know where these documents came from. I can even use the spreadsheet as a way of, of exporting subsets, all the principles from Germany, all the principles from Canada, and I could then compare the Canadian, uh, I, I would just concatenate those as single documents and compare the Canadian and German uh, principles. So I'm gonna stop here and let you ask some questions about uh, this method of importing uh, documents. I do, wanna, I do wanna stress that uh, there's much more detail on how to do this in, in walkthrough four, managing corpora with spreadsheets so if you feel that this went by too quickly and later want to sort of recapitulate it you can you can always get access to it there so go ahead and uh let, let's have some questions so there is a question what is types and ratio columns okay so um uh, when we're dealing with um, uh, some of the jargon of text analysis, if you so a token, each word. <clears throat> so when you take the text and you sit, you divide it into what uh, typically you tokenize on words. It's not always, but we tokenize on words. And so, and those are called tokens. So in the AI guidelines from, uh, sorry, in the Montreal Declaration, there are 3,208 words. T types is the number of unique words. So, uh, you know, if I had a text which had one word repeated a thousand times, there would be a thousand tokens or words and one type. And this is a ratio of them and calculate the number of words per sentence. All of these things you should, uh, you should take with a grain of salt. For example, in English, don't, we will typically tokenize don't as one word, but you might consider it do not as two words. And especially when it comes to tokenizing languages other than English, our tokenizer is not, uh, is not necessarily gonna do it right. So when you're tokenizing Greek, uh, if, you, if it's really important for you to know exactly the number of words and the number of types, you probably want to use a tool from Claren that has been optimized for Greek tokenization. Likewise, especially these documents that have declarations of principles, there's lots of phrases. So, you know, we're calculating the sentences based on punctuation, but often you get phrases just just looking at the text here you know this might actually be treating everything one long sentence when you might actually want to sort of divide it and that's probably why we have so many, such a high number of words per sentence uh, i think why not so here we see a table and this documents display is all. And one of the tables is you can um, you can sort them in different ways. Let me see. Uh, so um, right now, this table is sorted by the count. So we have the highest frequency word at the top. But if you click down here. 
you can reverse that. So now we're sort of, so now we're looking at the hapax legomena, the words that only occur once. And you'll see on the side here, we have a little spark line because it only occurs once. You know, there it is. And to make life more interesting, we have a bunch of other statistical measurements. If you go down over here and you click down and then you pull down to columns, we have options first. So I'm going to set the comparison corpus to be Shakespeare's plays. And now it's going to grind away a while and, and uh, hopefully it won't. Th this is the type of thing that can crash. So what this is, is uh, this takes the relative frequency of the words in my corpus and then it takes the relative frequency of similar words, uh, of words in Shakespeare, and it compares the relative frequency, and what it shows me is the words that show up far more often in my corpus than in Shakespeare. And of course, Shakespeare doesn't talk about artificial intelligence, unless you include some of the spirits and fairies and stuff. So all, th this is gonna show me the, the, the words that are more unique to this corpus. And likewise, if you go here, we have all these different uh, peak, all these different statistical uh, measurements, many of which I do not fully understand. So skew sort of tells you um, in the corpus, does it, you know, does it start high and go down or start low and go up? Peakedness, does it have extreme differences between some documents it's low and some it's very high, and so on and so on and so on. So these are um, different measurements that you can draw, that you can call up as columns, and then you can sort them in different ways. Uh, there is, just to, just to be, just to be really, uh, just to cause some trouble here, or not, not trouble. For those of you who are into the statistics, I'm opening a display called document terms. And in the case of, uh, wait, sorry, I'm just clicking on the wrong thing here. Uh, the Zoom tools are getting in the way here. Um, so document terms will show you a, a table of words for a particular document. So if I click on the uh, commitments and principles, now I see only the terms in document number two. And for those of you who are into statistics, we have TFIDF, we call it significance. So this shows you, um, this will sort the words according to which words show up far more often in this document compared to the rest of the according to a completely different corpus or comparing to the to the other documents in the corpus using term frequency inverse document frequency which is which is a statistical a common statistical technique so, uh, and remember, if you're feeling overwhelmed, remember that the thing about Voyant is you can't make mistakes. You just go in, you click around, you, you, you play, you, 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 you kick the tires. Uh, if it crashes for some reason, and when you start using some of these statistical techniques is often when it likes to crash, uh, you just restart, no harm done. So I'll take, I'll take some questions now. No questions. There is a demand uh, if we could see an example of how an XML file can be processed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Funny you should mention that. So here I have an XML file. This is, uh, so I've loaded, uh, those of you who know XML will know that if you load an XML file in Chrome and you don't have a style sheet, it shows you it shows you the hierarchy of elements. 
So I have my XML file, is, the root element is collection. I have a head with a little bit of, of metadata. You can see I put this together for uh, some, a class. Then I have a, a body with four items. <coughs> and each one of these <coughs> items has its own little bit of metadata, the title of the item the URL, and then the full text. And these are all web pages that I grabbed uh, about, I, I just Googled Elton John, because I'm of a, an older generation, um, you know, I love Elton John, and I'm probably the only person in Edmonton. But, uh, so I, I have this little corpus of four web pages, What's interesting is I tried to grab different types of web pages. So two of them are from the official website. One is the Wikipedia entry and one is a review. And you'll notice, for those of you who know XML, as I've added an attribute, uh, a type attribute. And I could add all sorts of attributes. This is the equivalent in the spreadsheet. You can add columns to add your own metadata. Uh, if you're working with Voyant and want to add metadata, and what's really cool in a second, you'll see how I can use that metadata when I load the corpus. Um, the easiest way to do that is to use attributes to the items. So if I was doing interviews, I could, again, I could have gender, uh, age, location, date of interview, uh, so and so and so on. So I could have a whole, I could have a whole mess of these attributes right in the XML. So that's how my XML is structured. So now going back, um, uh, so da, da, da. so I'm going to go back to the entry screen. I'm going back now to the options for entering data, and now I'm gonna choose XML. And here's where you really have to know XPath. So XPath is uh, an XML language that is used for specifying uh, types of locations in an XML file. I probably don't have that exactly right, but it is, it's used, uh, it's used when you wanna query or when you wanna specify parts of XML things. So you, you, you really want to, if you're gonna use XML, you wanna make sure you have an understanding of both how to create a well-formed uh, XML document. You don't need to validate, you just need a well-formed document and you need, need to know enough XPath to do is I'm going to specify where the content is. And this is a lot like the spreadsheet <clears throat> with one exception. So the content is all in is all in the text element. So we've got the item element and then a child element is in each one is text. That's where the content is. Now I want to see where is the title. So the title is going to be in the title element inside the item element. So I'm going to say item forward slash title. The documents are going to be the item element. So, so far, this is the same thing that I did with the spreadsheet. The difference with XML is you're not, <clears throat> you're not limited to small text. You can have a really big XML file. The, the one thing I'm gonna do, which is new, which is very cool, if I may say so, is I can use an attribute to group the documents. So you may remember that I have, um, I have, uh, I have two items which are official web pages, and then one Wikipedia and one review. If I had 50, uh, if I had 50 web pages, I might have, you know, 10 official web pages, 
I might have Wikipedia pages for different albums. I might have a whole mess of reviews. So I can, I have this, uh, I have this attribute in which I've, I've entered. <clears throat> and what I'm telling it to do is I'm telling it to group all the documents by the attribute type. So I want, instead of having four documents, I want the two official ones to be treated as one document. And now, of course, uh, I'm just going to very quickly check that I've entered this right. Um, and in fact, I did not. I'm actually going to, uh, for the titles, because I'm grouping it, I actually want the attribute to be the title of the document. Because I'm grouping the official ones, there, there'll be two actual titles, and I want the title to be official, the word official. Uh, so now I've got uh, the XPath right. We all um, cross our fingers. We choose the XML document. And there we are. If you look here, I don't have four documents. You look here, I have three documents. It's taken the two official web pages and it's grouped them into one using the attribute. And the neat thing is, is that if I have a complex corpus, I could have many attributes. And every time I load it into Voyant, I could use different attributes and group and end up with different forms of comparison. So if I'm, uh, uh, to give a different sort of example, if I'm loading Romeo and Juliet, and if I have an element, a, a speaker element, I can, and let's say I want to compare Romeo's language to Juliet's language, I would tell Voyant that uh, the content, uh, that the items are the speaker element, and that I want it grouped by name of speaker. And then I would end up with, you know, each of, you know, assuming my XML for Romeo and Juliet was, was uh, well formed, I would end up being able to compare the language of all of the different speakers. And it would concatenate, it would take each one of Romeo's speeches and treat it as one long text, one document, each of Juliet's, uh, each of, you know, each of the other characters. So I'm going to stop there and ask if there are questions about uh, this way of doing things. No, I don't see any question. So th this is a bad sign because if you think this, <laughs> so I strongly encourage you to go to walk through four if you want to try this uh, on spreadsheets and XML. I also, of course, encourage you, uh, if you're new to XML, before you try this, you want to make sure that you understand how to create well-formed XML and how to create it so it will work with Voyant. <clears throat> so I encourage you to talk to somebody who um, uh, is familiar with XML. A common problem that will crash Voyant is that if people grab uh, texts off the internet and put them together in XML file, you can often have in internet text, you will have ampersands. And the ampersand in XML is a reserved character for entities and that will choke it. Uh, the document will not be well formed. Likewise, you may have angle brackets, which are reserved characters in XML. So you have to clean the reserved characters, the angle brackets and the ampersands you have to clean those out before and make sure that the document is well formed before it'll work in Voyant or for that matter, work in any XML processor. Okay. If there aren't any questions, I'm gonna switch to something even more complicated. Oh. I, I think I hear a question. Mm. Nope. Um, 
comment. The XML and path features is great, but I must follow the instructions again to understand this. It's just a comment. Uh, yes, you do want to go through the instructions, the, uh, especially the, the area where I trip up personally is uh, I don't use an XML or XPath enough. Every time I go in there, I never get the XPath right. And I, the, the, the defining the XPath in order to group by and to extract the right information <clears throat> is usually one of the things it's one of the two places where things don't work right. The first place is if I'm grabbing text in the wild, I almost always end up with something that is not well formed, that has an ampersand or ankle brackets or something, or, or in my own XML, I don't close an element properly. Uh, so it, it always takes me a while to get to, to, to clean up the XML. I use Oxygen to help me. I also just use Chrome. If you take an XML file and drop it into Chrome with no style sheet, it'll tell you where the bugs are. Uh, and uh, you'll know it is well formed when you get a nice little outline that can collapse and open the way this one does. That's a sign that it will work in Voyant. But if there's any bugs in it, if there's a loose, character uh, reserved character or something like that it'll give you an error message with the line number and you can go to the line number and and and, and debug it um, so yes uh, you lo look at the look at the walkthrough that we give and give us feedback if it's not enough information um, yeah and if you want to learn XML w3 schools as a pretty good, I mean, it's one of the XML tutorials that'll take you through how to, what XML is. It, it may be more than you need. Um, so I'll stop there. I have five minutes left. So I wanna show some of the text mining features. So, um, In the, in the blue bar, so the, the gray bars are for the individual panels and stuff. In the blue bar, if you click the little, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the button that allows you to change tools, at the very top, you'll see that we actually have three different view, what we call views. So you've already seen this default corpus view. So this is the view with a particular set of tools. <clears throat> but we have a complete, a very different view called scatter plot, which combines a bunch of text mining uh, tools into, into one uh, complex tool, if you will. And these can be a lot of fun to play with, um, but also it can be very frustrating to understand what's happening. So I just wanna give you a little overview of this. I should begin by saying that these text mining tools will only generate interesting results if you have a fair number of documents. These are not, you know, one web page is not gonna, it, it'll, it'll, It'll dice it up into 10 little mini bins, but it's not going to produce anything particularly interesting. This is for larger corpora. Secondly, these text mining tools are particularly useful at the beginning of a research project where you're exploring a corpus. You don't, you don't have any hypotheses yet. You don't have any conjectures. You're just sitting there going like, hmm, I've got all these interviews. I wonder if there's any patterns that might inspire some hypotheses, some conjectures that I could then use, uh, use Voyant to sort of zoom in on. Now the particular corpus that I'm looking at here, this corpus is, by the way, it is actually available to you. You'll see up on the, on the URL line here, it's corpus equals humanist. This is 21 years of the humanist discussion list. The humanist discussion list started in 1987. 
It's moderated by Willard McCarty. And it's been one of the primary places where in the digital humanities, what we used to call humanities computing, where conferences are announced, discussions take place, so on, so on, so on. So this is, this is a corpus. It's, a, if my memory serves, it's 20, 20 or so megabytes. It's a fairly big corpus, and it's a representation of a field over time. And it's the sort of thing that you're not going to read. Nobody's going to sit there and read an email discussion list uh, for 21 years. You know, it would bore the bore you. So this is exactly where you want to use text mining to make some suggestions. So I've loaded it up into the scatter plot view. And the first thing I want to do is to show you some ways you can control what you're seeing. Over here, I can control the labels. So I can get rid of the summary, which was covering some of what was happening here. I can actually get rid of the terms. So what I'm looking at now, uh, this, by the way, for those of you who are statistically inclined, is, uh, is the results of multiple correspondence analysis, which is a very interesting technique that has a long history in in France. It goes back to Benzacri, who in the 70s, it was widely used in France, both in digital humanities and linguistics. It was actually used widely in, um, in the social sciences for analyzing large uh, collections of both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, it's, it was really only later that it was discovered in the English-speaking world. Um, and one of the unique features of correspondence analysis is that they fold the document space and the term space into one visual display. So it, it can be very evocative and it can be very misleading. But what we see here, which is intriguing, is we see that the, the documents, which are chron chronological, they're, they're academic years, 1987, 88, 88, 89, 89, 90, 91, it's really interesting that up to 95 is clustering over here on the left. We have a bunch of 2000s over there in the middle. And then we have sort of some liminal years in, in, in uh, sorry, the, the 2000s are over on the right. And then we have some liminal years in the middle and then some other ones down here. So if I was, if I was doing an investigation, I'd sit there and go, oh, well, this is interesting. My documents are clustering, and it seems that something happens between 1995 and 1997, maybe 2000. What could have happened in the field of digital humanities in that particular period? Well, one way to check is to hide the document labels and to look at the terms. Let's see if there are any words because these words, you can think of them as sort of magnets. They're pulling, they're pulling the documents in different directions. And we have a bunch of words like web, href, HTTP, digital. This suggests that there was a change in the discourse in the digital humanities in the mid 90s around the web. And in fact, if you think about it, the web really took off uh, Netscape, um, uh, commercialized and, and went public as a stock offering in 1995. And that's in many ways when the web went from being a sort of arcane little thing happening in, in, in a lab in Switzerland to becoming something that was popular and widely used and there were browsers. And it changed the field of the digital humanities. We actually changed our name from humanities computing with a focus on the computer and software, which is the words over on the left, to thinking much more about the digital and using the web as a way of distributing our innovations and knowledge. So what you see here is I'm forming, I'm using this text mining to form uh, some conjectures, which I can then uh, use other tools to test. Uh, but form congestures which might then turn into a paper or, or something like that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now show how you can manipulate this tool to test, your con uh, you know, to test your conjectures 
and to zoom in and out and stuff like that. So I'm going to show a bunch of things and then uh, I think we're already over the hours. So I will, uh, I'll move very fast and then stop. So over on the left here, we've got a panel which we can hide if we want it to go away. This panel allows us, uh, if I click on a document, it will show me where it is. So it shows me all the documents. If I collapse it, it shows me all the words. I can sort them in different ways. And I can even remove them. What happens if I get rid of href and http? So there's HTTP, HTTP, which seems like a sort of artifact. I remove it. Uh, well, we still have href. Right click or command click, I can remove it directly there. We still have something of the same thing here, but I can begin to trim this display to get rid of uh, the anomalies. On the other side, over here, I have a bunch of uh, other controls. One of the things I could do is get rid of those middle years. I could see if, uh, you know, if we actually get, so 95, 96, I'm going to get rid of these ones. And now what happens? Do we, we still seem to have, I'm going to change the labels. We still seem to have two clusters up to, uh, you know, a, cluster, a later one and an earlier one. <clears throat> so, um, you know, now the cluster, the, the arc has been reversed with 87 to 95 there, and then a cluster over there. So that's sort of interesting. I can change the, the measurement of the terms to raw frequencies or TF-IDF, neither of which you want to do, it'll throw the statistics off completely. Um, uh, the, I can actually change the dimensionality. Correspondence analysis generates multiple projected dimensions. We're actually showing three, two of them in the Cartesian grid, and the third one is being shown by how uh, dark or light the diamonds or circles are, but that can often be confusing, so I can reduce it. And then we can, it also will try to cluster. So it'll try to actually create clusters of words. It, it'll try to sort of suggest some clusters. Finally, and this is where there's a whole mess of power hidden away, we have other statistical techniques. Many of you will know principal component analysis. That will simply give us the terms. So it does not do the folding of document and term space. Uh, this is a form of machine learning that tries to do a better job of separating out the words so they don't all clump and become impossible to read. And then we have document similarity, which shows you just the documents and tries to show you clusters of the documents. And each one of these have different ways of doing the statistics that take this high dimensional uh, word document space and collapse it into something you can see. And I encourage you, uh, because uh, I've gone far too quickly, but walk through number five, exploring a text, uh, we'll go through more carefully about how you can use this to uh, create conjectures and also how you can test them because you never want to believe what you're seeing, <clears throat> uh, what you're seeing here because these techniques are hiding as much as they show. And I'm going to stop there with that warning and uh, ask for questions. Has, um, is everybody still there or has everybody left? No, everyone, everyone is here. Why? Oh, oh good. Uh, I heard silence. And you know, when you're talking with people in person, you guys are, are linguists. When you're talking in person, <laughs> a silence means one thing. When you're on Zoom, a silence can mean that the system is broken and you've been talking into the wind for, for half an hour. Oh, okay. But so you didn't listen to the question uh, I read. Sorry. 
Now, okay. Could you please describe how Voyant Toolset interfaces with Katma? Can we use Voyant Tools to visualize annotations the same way we use it to visualize words in a text corpus? Is there maybe a tutorial or walkthrough available on this topic? Is the first question. There are other questions too. So Do you prefer that, that, to, to answer. So uh, I'll start with Katma, and that's a good question. So. Um, so Katma has the capacity to export XML. You need to understand how to use. So if you're in Katma and you're sort of selecting passages in Katma, uh, you can export something and you have to use Python. You, you want to talk to the, the Katma developer, Marco Petrus, because uh, he will, at least in my case, you know, he's actually very friendly and will adapt. He's created some Python code, which will adapt their standoff markup. They use standoff markup, which we can't use. So they will adapt it to extract the XML, which you could then bring into Voyant. This is, you will gonna, if you're gonna do it yourself, you're gonna have to have some familiarity with Python and be able to edit their code. One of the strengths of Katma, which is going to be a weakness when you bring it into Voyant, is that it can have overla overlapping hierarchies. And Voyant, when it imports XML, it wants well-formed, uh, it, it wants XML with a single hierarchy. You can't, it can't handle the standoff and it can't handle the multiple hierarchy. So what you would, if you had a very complicated Katma document, you would want to export different, you know, so let's say you've got, you've got markup on, on, um, on, uh, on uh, verbal utterances, you know, where Trump is boasting, where he's uh, talking about how great America is. So you have one set of things and then you have markup on who's talking, Trump, Pence, whoever like that, and that's gonna overlap. And so you would have to export them separately as two different XML documents and study them separately with, uh, with Voyant. There is, to my knowledge, no tutorial on this. And uh, uh, Stefan spent some time with Chris Meister. And um, at one point, they had actually hooked Voyant up to Katma, but I don't know if that's still working or if that was just a prototype. So you could, from within Katma, sort of hit a button and it tried to do it for you automatically. Uh, I think Katma and Voyant make a great pair. And if somebody is, who is technically inclined wants to work with us to write a tutorial, I'd be happy to support that. Uh, so now I'm sure there's other, I'm sure I missed part of that questions. Uh, there are two questions, two more questions, and of course, uh, we'll let you <laughs> go as you must be very tired now. So, uh, no, 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 it, it, this is early in the morning. You guys are the ones who are tired. I, I'm just waking up. I'm happy to stay another half an hour or so, so don't worry about me. Uh, but but I'm sure many of you have uh, obligations at home and something like that. You, you know, disappear when you need to. Uh, can we run those text mining tasks based on the annotations? Um, yes, in the sense that the annotations that you put, that you can get in XML can become, uh, is what is used to group the documents. And then the text mining uh, the text mining is all those text mining techniques essentially start from a table of documents and words. And you can control what words. If you get rid of the stop words, you'll, you'll get the, the high frequency, uh, you know, the, the high frequency grammatical words, the uh, verbs, stuff like that. If you get, if you have a stop word list, you're going to have more content words. If you create a white word list, you can get the words exactly the ones that you want to study. Um, and with the documents, you saw how you could remove some of the documents and something like that. But the splitting into documents is what happens right at that moment of ingest with the XML. So that's where, um, that's where you can do the text mining. <clears throat> 
this is to some extent what we're trying to support with Spidal. Once Spidal is working, you have the full programming language of JavaScript, and JavaScript has all sorts of libraries for other forms of text mining. And in fact, you could, you could maybe take the output of some of our text mining and pass it on for further processing. But you'll need to, you'll need to know how to program in JavaScript. There is another question, and I think it's the last one, because uh, we will leave, uh, we must leave the room until uh, 7.30 anyway. How will you make the clustering? If there is a specific method, Ah, okay, thank you. I think that you just answered my question. It's okay. So right. no more questions. <laughs> okay. The um, I, I encourage people if they use the scatterplot tool, just like even if you were doing this in Python, that whenever you use those text mining tools, uh, you have to be careful about overinterpretation. And I'm sure those of you with a statistical background or linguistic background know all about that, but um, a a tool that uh, that I did not show, um, but a tool that gets overused, uh, overinterpreted, is topic modeling. Um, sorry, I just grabbed the wrong tool. We have a topic modeling tool, but this is a tool that people um, often overinterpret, especially people in the humanities who don't know a lot about st probabilistic methods like latent Dirichlet allocation. And you can see this is taking a while to happen, but they it, this generates these topics. Sometimes these topics are really interesting and people go to town with them and they don't realize how these are being generated and they overinterpret them. So I, I just want to stress that um, the need to all, you know, talk to someone with some statistical background, always test your anything you think you're seeing, go in and read the full text and test that it's actually there. So maybe we will finish here if Sounds you don't want to add something or <laughs> so, uh, thank you. I don't know. Yes. I'm happy to take more questions, but uh, I, I also realize that you're probably all uh, uh, overwhelmed. Maybe if there are questions, uh, they can address. Uh, they can be addressed to you personally or to us, and uh, we will find a way to answer them. Perfect. And if and you then, want, yes, if you want, if you want another little mini seminar, if there's something a particular group, particular project, uh, I'm happy to just informally, you know, come online. Um, and uh and and look at what you're doing and show you other stuff thank you very much thank you very much i would like to thank uh, to thank you thank uh, professor sinclair for being with us uh, you for this insightful uh, presentation both of you for the gift uh to the community where your tools the hard work <laughs> you do uh, it was a great chance for us to have you with us and uh, to listen to this uh, presentation. Thank you for the availability <laughs> and um, we hope uh, we'll have you again in the future. Uh, I want to thank also all the participants for joining us. Uh, and um, if I can uh, say that uh, we are ready to, to help uh, with the interface of the language of Voyant um, uh, Tools and to convert it in Greek, we will be more than happy as a team to, to help you and have it uh, as soon as possible. And uh, of course, to uh, the participants uh, suggest that they follow uh, our activities and find perhaps the next seminar with 
very helpful. Um, many other seminars concerning uh, the digital humanities and uh, language technology. We thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you, and, and have a great evening.